Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Day Springs. It's a very special Good Friday service. Uh, my name is Pastor Dan, and I am just so glad you've chosen to be with us tonight. My wife Amy is here with us tonight. Amy, it's good to have you as always. Thank you so much, and we're so glad that you've joined us. If you are live on Facebook with us or um, on YouTube, go ahead and let us know in the comments. We would love to know if you're watching with us today. And go ahead and share this to your Facebook page. Invite friends to join, join us. Who knows, maybe they're sitting around at home tonight and have nothing to do, and they right. would tune in and hear the gospel message. Right. They're, they're stuck inside, and there's nothing else to watch, so they're going to watch this. But that'd be a good thing, wouldn't it? So, yeah, go ahead and share that right now. That'd be a great idea. Just uh, share it to your page and tag some people, and they'd probably tune in. So what we're going to do with this tonight, uh, we're going to uh, have some special music, um, and uh, the Youngs are going to join us tonight. It'll be fun. And then we're going to open up the Bible and have a Bible study tonight, because I think it's really important on Good Friday um, that we talk about what happened on the week of Passion Week and what happened right before Easter. So we'll talk about it. I think it's going to be encouraging for you. I've got some things I'm going to challenge you on tonight, so I hope you're kind of ready to get challenged on that. Uh, so get your Bible. Go get your Bible. Uh, get, uh, get a Pepsi or a coffee, whatever, and uh, let's, uh, let's have a good time together, all right? So we'll have some announcements and some music tonight. Let's get started. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and sing tonight so you guys can join with us. The words will be on the screen. Let's start out with a few songs very fitting for tonight. Nothing but the blood of Jesus and Jesus paid it all. Let's sing those. Can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes. singing Jesus paid it all. Whiter than snow. Let's close with this one for now. Before the throne of God, above I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Let's sing this one. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. 
A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me fancy. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied. To look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am. The King of glory and of grace. One in himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and All right, at this time we're going to have some announcements and our offering uh, and the announcements for tonight uh, for our Good Friday service. Uh, we just want to give you a big welcome. Maybe you're new uh, and viewing us online. We're glad that you tuned in tonight uh, and we want to get to know you and we want to keep you up to date on what's happening here at Dayspring. Uh, hopefully things will get past this awkward stage and we'll be able to do more uh, ministry, uh, and we want to get you and keep you informed and uh, keep you in the loop uh, as far as things coming up at our church. So one of the ways that you can get to uh, know us, we can get to know you, is you can text the number on the screen. Uh, so on the screen, there's a number you can text that, and uh, we would be happy to get in touch with you that way. Or you can go to our website at mydayspringchurch.com uh, on our weekly bulletin. You can click on that. You'll find the verses for tonight. You'll also find uh, lyrics for the songs. And there's a button on there that says uh, new. And you can just click on there and uh, we can get to know you that way. Uh, but we'll get your info. We'll keep you up to date on all the things. Uh, those of you normal attenders, normal, uh, you're normally tune in. Uh, make sure you're checking your emails, Facebook, uh, and uh, just checking in uh, to make sure you're up to date on what's happening at Dayspring. Uh, so we want to do that uh, tonight. Also, um, I want to throw this out. If you are in need, uh, these, are, these are unique times. If you're in need, uh, you know, maybe you need someone to go out and get you groceries. Maybe you just need someone to talk to. Uh, feel free to call the church. You can call Dayspring. We'd be happy to talk with you. We'd be happy to help in any way that we can. Uh, so you can give us a call with that. Uh, also, uh, just a few announcements, things coming up. We have our blood drive coming up. The Red Cross is doing a blood drive at Dayspring. And so we want you to sign up. It's this coming Wednesday. And you can sign up at our website, My Dayspring Church. Uh, and you can schedule your reservation. And they'll be making sure that everything's done right, uh, considering the times that we live in uh, these past few weeks. So don't worry about that. But let's just make sure we're taking advantage of that. That's a way we can give back to the community. Uh, and I believe that's really important. Coming up this weekend is Easter, as we all know. Uh, and so with that, we have a special service plan on Sunday. We, at 10 o'clock, we've got a special kids program uh, featuring a, a Easter puppet show. Uh, and we are excited to present that for the kids. Uh, really just a, a lot of work went into it. And we hope that you guys can tune in for that. So that's at 10 a.m. 
uh, and spread the word around. Spread the word around. You know, share it on Facebook if you if you can get um, people tuning in for it. That'd be awesome uh, as we give the gospel through that uh, for the kids and parents. You can tune in also. That that would be allowed. At eleven o'clock, we've got our eleven a.m. Uh, Easter service, and we want you to tune in for that. And and again, spread the word. Let's not let this. Uh, this holiday, this time that is precious to us as we remember the resurrection of our Savior, uh, let's not let this pass into something that is just, well, we watched and we just stayed at home and we didn't reach out to others. Let's reach out to others. Let's spread the word. Let's be evangelistic during this time. And let's use Easter as a tool for that. Uh, Also, uh, one last thing that I want to hit is uh, the normal RU recovery group that uh, meets on Friday nights. Uh, If you are in a challenge group, you know who you are, uh, make sure you tune in for the second talk following this service. Uh, So that's just a general announcement for you uh, that come to the RU group uh, and and take advantage of the time with your challenge group uh, as we offer that. All right, that concludes our announcements. Let's go ahead and let's uh, pray for our offering. Uh, It's important that we remember as we think of Good Friday, we think of the sacrifice of our Savior. And we think of how he, he, he gave it all. He gave it all uh, for us. And what a challenge for us. You know, sometimes we can be just all about ourselves. We can be, um, it's easy to get self-centered. It's easy to be worried about self and where we're at. Uh, and it's just an important thing for us to, what, as Christians, become more like Christ. And, and to think of others, to think of things beyond us. Uh, so I challenge you with that. Tonight as we give, you can give three different ways. Uh, we're, we're challenging you to give. Uh, you can give through our online uh, at our website, mydayspringchurch.com. You can give through there. There's a give tab on the home page. You can click on that and give that way. Uh, you can give through your bank, uh, through online bill pay. Um, and you can take advantage of that. I, I just encourage you to, to think about that and to make sure that you're keeping Christ at the center of your giving. Let's go ahead and pray for our offering tonight, and then we'll have our offering. Dear Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for your love for us. Lord, we thank you how you are just providing. Uh, Lord, we see generosity uh, coming to this church during this time. Lord, we're thankful for all those that, who, have, who have really stepped out in faith during this time and uh, are, are giving, Lord. And, and Lord, you're blessing them, I know, uh, and will bless them. Lord, we pray that you would just challenge all of us not to get uh, just consumed with, with uh, self-centeredness or, or I'm worried about me, I'm worried about uh, my, my inner, what I, what I need, this, this, this list of things that I need, uh, Lord, but that you would challenge us to think beyond ourselves and to be givers, to be generous with what you've provided for us, Lord, and we know that you will bless. Lord, bless our offering tonight. Bless those givers. Uh, that, are, that are giving tonight, Lord. I pray that you would just bless the gift, Lord, and that you would just be with this ministry. Lord, provide and protect. Lord, be with us as we seek to um, evangelize. We seek to reach out, even during this time. But as, as things loosen up, as we, as we go into the next season of ministry, Lord, we pray that you would just provide for our needs. And Lord, that you would bless and provide. Lord, we're just so thankful that you are always there and that we can trust in you. Lord, bless this offering. In Jesus' name, amen.
I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. Didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotten in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, I mean, that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're gonna say, let Jesus go. And then I was gonna tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd and, and, they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, one minute, I, I am a man marked for death. And then the next, I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man, hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath. And he said, it is finished. And then, he died. Surely, this man was the son of God. All right, well, good evening everyone again. And uh, I really am glad that you chose to, to be with us tonight. We'll have a good time together tonight. If you got a Bible, I want you to grab your Bible. Uh, maybe you got one on your phone. That's good. But if you got, uh, if you got a real Bible, get that too. Uh, that'd be great. Uh, we're going to talk about some things tonight on Good Friday that uh, I want you to just kind of remember for a moment what, what happened, you know, 2,000 years ago. Yeah, I, I always have people ask me this question about Good Friday. So is Good Friday the day when Jesus died on the cross? Is today the day that he was crucified. So let me just give you a real quick, a real quick biblical answer on that, and then we'll go into the rest of our Bible study tonight. But, but according to the Bible, according to the timeline of the Bible, actually it wasn't Friday. It wasn't. I know we celebrate Good Friday uh, as the day that Christ died, and I'm actually okay with that, that we celebrate it on today, even though it's not the day, uh, according to the biblical timeline. The, the, main, the main thing, and, and uh, I've got some messages on our podcast about this, 
uh, some series I've done on the entire thing of, of what happened in the Passion Week. But the main thing is that, that the Bible says that he was in the tomb three days and three nights. And if you know the Jewish calendar, the, the, uh, the evening of the day, so let's say tonight at sunset, is actually considered the beginning of the next day. So tonight at sunset, which is Friday night at sunset, is actually the beginning of Saturday morning. So if you were to actually count back three days and three nights, and, and you know, I, I take the Bible literally. I take the Bible for what it says literally. Uh, he, couldn't have, he couldn't have died Friday night because he would only have been in the grave for what? Friday night and Saturday night. So that's only two nights he's in the grave. Uh, but if we look at it from a context of what the Jewish calendar had and what was happening, of course, you know, Saturday was a Sabbath. So there's, there's a day there that, that, uh, the, the, that wouldn't have worked <clears throat> according to if Jesus would have died, you know, on Friday night. So when did he die then? When to answer that question real easy is he died on Wednesday afternoon. And uh, then if you count the days and the nights from that, then Saturday night at sunset, Saturday night at sunset would have been the beginning of Sunday morning. So when did Jesus rise from the dead? Well, he rose from the dead sometime after Saturday night sunset, which would have been, what, Sunday morning. And to think about this, going back to Saturday being the Sabbath, the, the women weren't able to do work or whatever. And, and what, after the Sabbath is over, then they run to the tomb. So when would have they run to the tomb? Well, it would have been sometime after sunset on Saturday night. Uh, so, you know, if we were just to kind of guess at the timing of it, you know, maybe they got there at 8 o'clock at night, but Jesus was already gone Saturday night, which, again, would have been considered Sunday morning because it was after sunset. So if you count that backwards, uh, then you get three days and you get three nights. If you want to look into it further, like I said, I've got some podcasts online that actually walk through every day of the Passion Week uh, with a lot of proofs there and, and when it happened. But uh, there is, it's pretty much impossible that he would have died on Friday because uh, it just wouldn't work with the, the, with the biblical teaching of, of what took place on those days. So that's kind of an interesting thing, but I'm really okay with the fact that we celebrate uh, the crucifixion today. I mean, it, it's just totally fine with that. But it is kind of an oxymoron, so let's think about that for a moment. <laughs> we call it Good Friday. I, I, don't, I don't know. Church, what, what's so good about Good Friday? It's kind of a, a crazy way to say it. There, there's nothing good about Good Friday. You know, how many when you grew up, let me ask the question, when you were younger and uh, you were growing up and your parents would say to you, you know, right before you go about to get in trouble, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Do you ever have your parents say that? <laughs> yeah, sure you have. Or, or I'm doing this for your own good. And I'd be a little kid. My mom would be there taking care of me, you know, low, fast, and hard. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and, and, and I'd be like, well, this is for my own good. This is going to hurt me more. Well, how in the world can this hurt you? I'm the one that's getting disciplined right now. That doesn't even make sense. It's kind of an oxymoron to the whole thing. And, and I never quite understood what she meant by that. But, um, but as we look at Good Friday, there's kind of that same sentiment there of, of uh, this is a bad thing, but it really is going to be a good thing. The crucifixion was not pretty, and the, the week of the Passion Week was not pretty. And I want us to take a look at some of the things to just kind of show you how ugly that week really was and how not pretty uh, Good Friday really was. Okay, I want you kind of to, to use your imagination tonight to really kind of look into this story and see just how, how really brutally awful this whole series was and the crucifixion, everything leading up to the resurrection. So if we go, if we look at the calendar, so Sunday morning would have been Palm Sunday, right? And then, and then Jesus would have been having his last meal with the disciples. That would have been, that would have been on Tuesday, okay? Uh, and you think about that and you say, well, his last meal with his disciples. And, and uh, we know after the last meal, of course, they go... Uh, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's interesting to know, church, that, that only in biblical Christianity, only in the Bible, is the most accurate account of what happened on that week. Uh, not tradition, not what some church says, not what some author wrote, but this book is the only book that gives us an accurate account of what happened in Jerusalem on that weekend. And so all, the, uh, all the, the fury of hell is going to be released on Jesus. All the, the demonic oppression is going to be released at this time. 
And you think about just the cruelty of man is bad enough, but being influenced by uh, demonic spirits and being influenced by uh, Satan's forces, I think the, the cruelty of the Roman soldiers and, and uh, of the guards and so forth towards Jesus was even worse than anything, really, that we could ever possibly imagine. So if we look at the story, we kind of set in this moment. Let me just say this too. You, you see a lot of pictures of Jesus, and I've talked about this before, and and you always see Jesus, and, 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 and he looks, you know, on the cross there, or the Garden of Gethsemane, or, and, and he's got his blue eyes and his long flowing hair, and he just looks a little sad, but, but you know, still a handsome looking guy, and still looks like he's doing okay. I want you to see some things about this. You know, Jesus didn't walk around with a glow around his head like a lot of paintings portray it, and, and, and it wasn't much to look at. Matter of fact, if you've got your Bible, you can follow along. We'll try to put the verses up on the screen for this as well. But in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, it says this, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Now look at the next rest of this verse. He has no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The words that come to mind are the words plain, ordinary, regular, <laughs> Jesus was, was, in appearance, just a plain, ordinary, regular person. Uh, these are not the words that I would like to describe him as, you know, but this is what the Bible says it's at. He's just, th- these words by Isaiah were prophesied long before Jesus came, and, and he's, just, he's just a regular-looking guy, okay? So we've got to kind of get the, uh, the, uh, the starstruck look out of our mind or the Hollywood image of what Jesus may have looked at when we look at the week of the crucifixion. And, uh, uh, and then after, after the, the, uh, the Lord's Supper, we know they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and, uh, and they spend time praying there. Now, I've been to the Garden uh, of Gethsemane 14 times. And I uh, was a tour host and a tour guide uh, many years. And uh, that was awesome. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about that today. Uh, I, I really have a... Uh, I don't know the word to say. I really have a hankering to go to Israel again. I think it would just be a lot of fun to go again. And uh, I love, I love, I love leading tours to Israel and uh, to the, the those places there. Um, I was thinking about this today. I'd really like, and we've kind of talked about it. You know, maybe, 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 Lord willing, maybe we go in March of of 2021. We try to go to, to Israel as a church, just our church, and. Uh, you know, maybe, it's, maybe it's, just, it's just 20 of us or just 30 of us go. That's totally fine. We, you know, I'm used to going with big groups and, and going with 100, you know, 120 people, 150 people, and that's what I'm used to going. The largest group I ever was on uh, as a guide was, was over 200. Uh, and that's always fun to do a big group. But I'll be honest, it's actually a lot more fun to go in a small group because we can hit a lot more places. Uh, it doesn't take so long to, you know, wait in line for the bathroom, <laughs> you know, and then we check in and out of the hotel faster. So we could actually see a lot more with a small group. So I don't know. Think about that. Pray about that. Save up your shekels. You know, maybe if something comes together and this whole COVID-19 thing settles down. Maybe we could try to put together a trip in March. I don't know. It'd be a long shot, but uh, uh, it really it would be life-changing. And that would be something that you really got to save up your, your money to go. But, but Luke chapter 22, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. So they were, they were having dinner together. And then Jesus and the disciples walked down to a garden. It's literally a garden. It's still there today. And verse 44 of Luke chapter 22 says this. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So you see that, that there's, there's so much stress going on here that it's, it's, it's medically a, a situation where there is stress. The capillaries underneath your skin can burst. Blood can actually uh, uh, penetrate out through your skin because of the high level of stress and emotional pressure. Now, no one, me or you, this has never happened to any of us because we've never been under that kind of stress because we live in America. Things just don't get that bad. But Jesus is here, and I want you just to kind of imagine that you know, the Bible here is talking and, and, and says that he's praying and, and he's sweating, literally sweating drops of blood. So, so, so think of how Jesus is starting to look. Okay, it's nighttime. He has been sleep deprived, so he's already exhausted. He's been praying and he's been dripping sweat. Now, 
Now think, church. He didn't have a mirror. He didn't have, you know, Purell wipes. Imagine uh, uh, what you look like after you sweat, if you were out in a hot sunny day cutting the grass or, or playing tennis or playing basketball. Imagine what you look like with just sweat. Well, imagine if all that sweat on you was blood. Okay, imagine what that would look like. Imagine if all that red, the dried blood, would start to dry in your face and in your skin and in your pores and the smeared blood from wiping your face or wiping your hands. Are you starting to get a picture of how ugly, really, Good Friday was? Are you starting to get an idea of it? So he's exhausted. He's been praying. He's, he's fatigued. And now he's going to go to this trial, the most intense trial that's ever been faced by man. And the soldiers of that day were inhumane just because they were Roman soldiers. But I believe, add on top of just the normal uh, cruelty of, of the human nature, you add on that demonic oppression, uh, demonic influence. I believe that the Roman soldiers of that day would have, just by context of the story, would have been more cruel and more barbaric than normally just because of the spiritual battle that would have been taking place. And so if we go over to Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, back in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, it talks about the beating that he would have gotten by the soldiers uh, around the time of his trial. So this is after the Garden of Gethsemane. Isaiah 50, uh, verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 52, verse 14. As many were stoned at thee, his visage, now get this, church, because this is so important, his visage was so marred more than any man. Now, church, let me ask a question. Do, do you believe this Bible is real? Do you believe this is the truth? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Type in an amen, right? Okay, do you believe every word in this Bible from cover to cover? I believe cover to cover. I believe the cover. It says Holy Bible on it. Now, the Bible prophesies here in the book of Isaiah, years before Christ came, telling what this beating was going to look like, what it would look like. And it says, his visage was so marred, it says, more than any man. Which tells me what? Which tells me he was beat up more than any man had ever been beat up on the history of earth, or ever will be. His, his visage, the way he looked, was worse than any man could have ever possibly looked. And it wasn't just, you know, we kind of sterilized it a little bit. It wasn't just, just, well, he got punched or he got, you know, beat with, you know, a, a little straps of leather or something. Or, you know, they pulled a couple of the beards, off, hair off his face. But no, they beat him so much. But here's the interesting part. Jesus could not die. It, no matter what they did to him, now you got to get this. They could not kill him. Why can't they kill him? Because, because, because he has to give up his own life. He has to do it on the cross. Jesus has to what? Willingly give up the spirit. So no one ever actually killed him. He had to willingly give it up, which means what? Which means all Satan, uh, Satan's forces, all demonic powers knew this. They knew this. They, they had read the book of Isaiah, and, and they knew that this could get really terrible. So I think the soldiers... Not only were trying to beat him as any as they would have as they would have beat any prisoner just to beat them and just to avoid a trial and just to hopefully the guy dies before we even have to go through with this trial and the hanging and all this let's just try to let's just try to teach him a good lesson here and maybe if we're lucky he'll die. But not only was it just that bad, but I think they tried even harder because of the demonic oppression and the demonic forces that were taking place at that time. Because Satan and all of his followers knew that Jesus could not be killed. They knew that. They, they know he can't be killed. They, they tried to kill him. But Satan knows. He read the book of Isaiah. And so they beat him so bad that he probably was totally unrecognizable as a person. You know, a scourging alone, when it talks about him being scourged, you know, again, was, was, was no little, like, you know, whipping with a little belt. It, it would have been um, uh, 39 lashes with the, what's called a cat of nine tails, which is a, a, uh, uh, leather straps, and they would have put pieces of, of shell like from the sea, uh, seashore. They would have broken those up and, and tied shells in there or pieces of uh, Roman glass to it or maybe some sharp stones like what they'd use for spears. And they would literally whip the person 
And those pieces of seashells and glass and, and stone would have just dug in and grabbed onto the flesh. And so it wasn't just a beating like a, like a spanking. It was more of these things uh, being whipped, being whipped onto someone's back, uh, and then being pulled out and literally tearing the flesh. And, and they didn't have, you know, rules of engagement back then as far as how they did it. They would have just beat him no matter how he was laying, no matter where he was laying. So he would have been laying on the ground. He could have been rolling over. It doesn't matter. They are going to be whipping him so much so that the, literally the skin was probably hanging off him worse than, than anything any of us could ever imagine or Hollywood could ever dream up to tell the story because it says that, that it, it was worse than any man's ever been. So if the Bible says it's worse than any man's ever been, well then it's worse than any man's ever been. And, and it says that he doesn't even look like a man anymore. It was probably literally his flesh hanging off him. There was probably exposed organs hanging out. There was probably bones all over. Uh, uh, he looked terrible beforehand, and now you know we're into the look of, of horror story type of a thing where it's just, it's just terrible. And his back and his sides, his abdomen are literally probably just ripped to pieces. There are just muscles showing and, and blood everywhere and beaten. And then go down to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Now look at this, these next six words. Yet he opened not his mouth. So Jesus is still in control. Okay, Had it been me or you, we would have been what? We would have been out of control. Had it been me or you getting whipped, we would have been screaming. We would have been saying, I'm innocent. We would have been saying, stop it. We would have been pleading for mercy. But the Bible says that he was, he, all this had happened, he was still in control and he opened not his mouth. Hmm. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Luke in the New Testament talks about the same story. Luke chapter 22, verse 64. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that, that smote thee? So, so tell us who it was. Of course, Jesus knew exactly who it was that, that struck him, who beat him. Of course that. But he says nothing. He, he decides, I'm not going to say anything. And, and this is kind of interesting, again, is that he had to stay alive right here. He, they, they couldn't have killed him, no matter how hard they could have tried. It was impossible, literally, to kill Jesus at this moment. It was totally impossible for them to do it. And, and then the trial comes that night, early the next morning, and, and there's, there's the shouts of crucify him. It is kind of amazing how many people are there. You know, we know, we know uh, Peter's there. We know John's off in the distance there. And, and there's enough people that there's bonfires going and they're keeping, keeping themselves warm outside the trial that's taking place. And so, so there's enough people there. There's a crowd gathered. They're crying, crucify him. And the disciples had already fled. The disciples had already left. They're gone you know, outside those two. And there's Jesus and he's, he's stripped naked and he's nailed to a cross and he's hanging there for... For all the world to see. And, and there is no modesty. He is probably a disgusting sight to look upon. Any of the photos that you may see of a, a, a nice, calmly put together uh, Jesus being nailed on a cross is totally inaccurate. They're totally inaccurate. Because the sight of him would have been so awful that you, you and I wouldn't have been able to bear to even look at it. It is just impossible for us to even imagine it. And and, and then if that's not bad enough at the moment of crucifixion when he's hanging there, at the pinnacle of the whole thing, what happens? Well, the Father in heaven places on Jesus the sins of all mankind. Because remember, Jesus wasn't just dying as a guy who had a bad day or not just dying as a prophet who was a martyr, but his death literally was to pay the sin debt of mankind so, so you have Jesus. Now, now, remember this, church. He'd never experienced sin before. He'd never, never experienced something so devastating as that. He, he'd never experienced the separation from his heavenly Father. 
And you and I don't get that because we just kind of imagine our kids and we say, well, it's fine if my kids leave me for a day. But no, this wasn't just I'm separated physically from my father. This was a, a spiritual situation. It was a separation. Jesus literally is taking the weight of sin on his shoulders. And that's a lot of sin. That, it would have been bad enough, church, if he would have just died, let's say, for one man's sin. You know, I mean, if you or I had died because of the bad things we've done, there, there would have been enough burden there just for us to say, oh, man, the, the sin that I have, the burden that I have is just so much. And it's just us. Because I can't imagine what it would be like to die on a cross and, and, and bear your burdens as well as my burden, to bear your sin as well as my sin. But Jesus has, has the sin of the whole world. And, and not just the whole world that was known in the year, you know, 2,000 years ago when he died, but the whole world from Genesis, you know, chapter 3, or Genesis chapter 1, when, when Adam and Eve are there, right? All the way to the very end of the tribulation, all the way through the, the whole time, all the sins of all mankind for, for the whole time period is put on the weight of Jesus. And the Father puts that burden on him. And as if it wasn't bad enough, it's terrible now because now there's a spiritual, a spiritual component to the whole thing even more that I am going to pay for the sins of all mankind. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46 says this, And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But someone asked me, so Pastor, so why, why did God forsake him? Why didn't God come down and just kind of put his arm around him and, and say, you know, I'll go through this with you? Well, you have to remember this, because, because the Heavenly Father, he can't be in the presence of sin, okay? God the Father can't be in the presence of sin, and when his son took the sin weight of the, of the world on him, I can't be part of that. I, I, I can't be part of that. I'm, I'm God the Father. That, that's, that's your job to pay the sin debt of mankind, but I can't be part of that. And, and uh, God the Father knew that he was going to have to turn from his son there. Jesus, who had never sinned, who was perfect, pure, and holy, was literally made sin for us. You know, in the New Testament, if you've got your Bible, look in the New Testament. Uh, go over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, the letter that Paul wrote to the churches there comes before Galatians and Philippians and Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21. Look at this verse. For he, that's God, hath made him, well, who's him? That's Jesus. So he, God, has made Jesus to be what? To be sin for us. Who, who knew no sin, why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So God said literally, my son is going to be made sin for you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and all the people of all mankind for all of eternity, past and present. The sin, the sin burden will be paid by my son. He literally will be bearing the, the sin burden. John chapter 19, verse 30. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Interesting to note there. Take your pen and underline those last four words. Gave up the ghost. Okay? No, no one killed Jesus. Jesus willingly gave of his life, saying, Okay, I will now be the sin sacrifice for all of mankind. You're, you're not going to uh, force me to do this. No one's going to... Uh, 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 pull the trigger, so to speak, and kill me, but I'm going, I'm going to give it up willingly. I'm going to give up my spirit. I'm going to die willingly to pay that debt. Uh, church, I don't know, but when, <laughs> when I read this passage, this does not seem like a good Friday to me. It does, does not seem like something that's good here. Again, it, it seems like a total oxymoron, and yet we know that it had to be a bad, dark, awful crucifixion. It had to be a, a bad Friday so that there would be what? A resurrection Sunday, right? There, there wouldn't be a good Sunday. <laughs> That's what we should call it. We ought to call it Good Sunday. That's what it should be called. You know, Terrible Friday, Good Sunday. So what's really the good of Good Friday? Well, the good came about the fact that when Jesus did die on the cross and did pay our sin debt, 
His, his blood was what paid the debt for us. That's the good that came out of Good Friday. Had, had Jesus never gone to the cross, our debt would have never been paid. It just wouldn't have been paid. There, there, there's no other way to do it. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. So if you're in Galatians still, uh, or Corinthians still, go over to the right. 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption, what? What's the next three words? Through his blood. Right? The only way we have redemption is through his blood. And look at the rest of the verse. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. A few weeks ago in church, when we were together here in church, I talked about there's a movement out there called the crossless gospel. Where the cross has nothing to do with the gospel. This is according to some people. And they say, well, you know, you just have to believe in this guy named Jesus, this prophet, this, 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 this son of God even, that you just, you just believe in Jesus, you know, whatever that means. But the cross has nothing to do with the gospel. Well, according to this verse and many other verses, the crucifixion had everything to do with the gospel, right? Had, had there not been a shedding of blood, literally, literally the shedding of blood, his death on the cross, the sin debt wouldn't have been paid, right? Just the fact that Jesus was down here on earth. I mean, from the time he was born, the story of Christmas, all the way up to the crucifixion, if Jesus had just been here, and he'd just been a good guy, and he just healed people, and he just made the lame walk, and he just raised people from the dead, if Jesus had just done all those things, that's really nice. But the sin debt wasn't paid by Jesus just being here. The, the sin debt wasn't paid by Jesus being born in a manger. That's why at Christmas time I just, I just hate leaving Jesus in a manger because that's not the story of salvation. That's nice that he was born in a manger. It's a cute story. But that's not salvation right there. That's, just, that's a fact, okay? It wasn't until he actually died on that cross and three days later rose again, proving, proving that he's the only one that can conquer death. He had, a, he had to rise from the dead, not just die, but he had to beat death, Okay? So up until that point, from birth to the, to the cross, Jesus did a lot of great things, and it was wonderful. And we learned a lot from it. But that wasn't our salvation. Our salvation was the fact that he died on the cross, was buried. Three days later, he rose again. That is our salvation. That is, that is what paid our sin debt. That's what proved the sin debt was paid. That's what proved the Father accepted the debt being paid. And that's how we can know for certain we have eternal life. Why? Because, because he rose from the dead. Well, we're going to rise from the dead. Okay, death didn't, death didn't stop him. Well, death won't stop us either. And so I want you just to remember that, that when we talk about Good Friday, we talk about Easter, and I know it's kind of a weird, it, it's not kind of weird, it's a really weird <laughs> last month or two. You know, right now, normally for, for Easter Sunday, our church is thinking about Easter eggs and all the kids. We usually get, you know, a thousand something kids come out to our church and we, uh, we give them candy, you know, we give them the gospel, we have a puppet show and and we have all the parents, our auditorium's usually packed, and, and we'll give all the people the gospel and tell them about the resurrection of Christ. But, but this weekend, with, with the church doors being closed and all of us staying home for Easter, right? Uh, and that's a good thing that we do that, but it just seems kind of strange. But I'm almost hoping, I'm almost praying that maybe the fact that we're all kind of stuck at home, maybe this morning you'll just take a moment to reflect on what really Easter means. Because... Because a frustration of Easter morning, here's, here's a frustration sometimes, is we're so worried about how we look and putting the cute dress on our, our little girls and, and the cute little suit on our boys and getting them all set to go. And, and we're so busy with the activities of Easter Sunday morning that it's really easy to forget, wait a second, what am I doing on Easter Sunday morning? Because you know, the excitement of the whole event just distracts us from the purpose of the whole event. So maybe, maybe there's a blessing in the fact that we're kind of hunkered down at home. Maybe you'll take some time this weekend and Saturday and Sunday morning to really truly reflect on, on what it really means that Christ really did die on the cross. And you'll be thankful for that. You'll, you'll spend some time in prayer just saying, Jesus, just thank you, okay? I mean, your prayer doesn't have to be long or, 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 or real, real rhymy or real poetic. You just have to pray, dear God, just... I'm thankful that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid my sin debt, and I can know for certain I have eternal life, not because I'm good, but because 2,000 years ago on Resurrection Sunday, 
I was forgiven. You know, on the cross when he died, I was forgiven. It's paid for. What he said in that verse we just read, it is finished. It's over. That, that's, the, that's the only good and good Friday right there is that it is finished. You know, that was it right there. Maybe some of you are watching today and you don't know. You don't know for certain if, if, if you would go to heaven when you die. Maybe, maybe you're a person that you've heard about the story of the resurrection. Maybe you heard about Jesus dying on the cross. I mean, you go to a church, you, you grew up and you heard, yeah, 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 I know that. But the question today, let me ask you this, is, is have you, have you, you watching right there in your living room, have you ever personally trusted in what Jesus Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago? So we could talk about Black Friday, or Good Friday, Black Friday. That's the wrong holiday, right? <laughs> we could talk about Good Friday. We, we, we could talk about Resurrection Sunday, and maybe you know that up here. But, but have you ever trusted with what Christ did for you? Have you ever put your trust in the fact that when Jesus died, he died for you? Have you ever done that? To understand the fact that, that when he died, he literally paid my sin debt. Let me use my, uh, my glasses. I like to use my glasses. But just pretend for a moment. Would you watch this for a moment? And we'll be done. Just pretend this hand's me and you. Pretend that these glasses are all the bad things we've done. Pretend for a moment that this hand's God. God's in heaven, right? Heaven's perfect. There, there's no sin in heaven, right? This is just a great way to show it. But the Bible says that God so loved the world, John chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved the world, that what? That he gave his only begotten son. That was Jesus. So God says, I love you, but boy, I hate the sin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give my son Jesus, right? The story of, of Christmas, right? That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The fact that when Jesus died, watch this, when Jesus died, his death paid the sin debt, right? The book of Romans says this, the wages, the cost, the mortgage of, of the bad things we've done is not going to church, is not getting baptized. How about this? It's not repenting from all of your sins, because you can't change from all your sins. You've never done it. You haven't. You haven't. Don't say you've done it. Because there's no way. You still sin and I still sin. No one's even done it. That's not a qualification from the, for the gospel. It's not. Someone made that up to try to make church members start behaving. But that's not the Bible. Church, that's Catholicism right there. Okay? And I, I love our Catholic friends. But the guys, that's not in the Bible. It's not. Turning from your bad ways does not pay the sin debt. Only death pays that sin debt. And God said, I love you, but I hate the sin. Therefore, when my son dies on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, his death will pay that mortgage. Buried three days later, rose again, showing the debt had been paid. And God says, you know what? I love you, and my son paid your sin debt. I'll look at you through my son and see that you're forgiven. You're justified. The word justified means just as if I've never sinned. Justified, okay? And God says, all I want you to do is believe that. Not, not just a casual thing like, well, yeah, I believe there's a guy named Jesus, whatever. No, God, I'm a sinner. God, I, I can't pay this, but God, I believe that Jesus paid my sins and I'm accepting that for the payment of my sin debt. And God says, you know what? The moment you've trusted in that alone is the moment you became part of my family. Forever, never to be lost, never to be forsaken. You can't walk away from it. You're saved forever, okay? Have you ever done that today? I mean, I'm just being honest. When you sit here and you watch this tonight, have you ever had a time in your life where you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? You accepted what he did on the cross. Yes, I get it. And God, I'm, I'm, I don't understand everything, but I accept the fact that Jesus died for me. And that alone, that's what I'm trusting. And that's it. I'm not trusting in my baptism, not trusting in my church membership. God, I'm trusting in what your son did on the cross of Calvary. I accept his payment in my place. When you've done that, when you've prayed that, when, you've, when, you've, when you believe that, God says, you are forever part of my family. Yeah, every day I still sin. Every day you're going to sin. No one's sinless. No one's sinless. But the difference is this. Every day I sin, but my sins were forgiven on the cross of Calvary. 2,000 years ago. Why? Because I've accepted the fact that Jesus died on the cross and paid for my sins. I was, I was in second grade when I did it. It seems like it was just yesterday when I, when I first put my trust and totally put my trust in what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. And so from that time, from second, second grade all the way for the rest of eternity, I'm a child of God's, never to lose it, never to be forsaken. 
never to be forgotten. What a, what a, what a great thing to put your trust in Christ on today, Good Friday. It would just be a wonderful thing if you'd do that. I'll tell you what, I'll have a word of prayer. And uh, if you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, would you do it right now while I pray? You can do it right there in your, your living room or in your couch or wherever you're at right now. You can do that. You can put your trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary and trust in him alone. All right? Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for all you've done. Lord, we're thankful that Jesus died on the cross to pay our sins. Lord, maybe someone tonight is thinking that they've never, they've never truly accepted what Jesus did. They heard about it, but they've never put their trust in the fact that Jesus died for me. Father, in the quietness of their mind, speaking to the living God so they know they can't make a mistake, they, they could just pray something just like this. It's not a prayer that saves us, Lord, but, but maybe just something like this. Dear God, I, I realize I'm a sinner. And God, I, I can't pay my sin debt. God, I can't work for my sins. I can't pay them off by my works. But God, I believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross 2,000 years ago. And when he died on the cross, he paid my sin debt. And I believe that he rose again from the grave and that you accepted that. Lord, I'm taking by faith because you said that, because, because I know what happened and I truly believe that Jesus paid my sin debt. I'm accepting that today, Lord, and I'm putting my trust in that. And that alone, I'm not trusting in my baptism. I'm not trusting in my church membership, but I'm trusting in what Christ did on the cross alone. Father, forever, I'm a part of your family. Lord, if someone's done that today, watching on our live stream, would you, would you just give them a special blessing today, Lord? Would you work in their heart? Lord, when we get back together here, hopefully in a couple weeks, and have church again like normal, would you bring them out to church? I'd, I'd love to meet them. What a, what a great thing. What an honor to be able to shake their hand. And they could say they trusted you as their Savior on, on Good Friday, 2020. How awesome that would be. Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for getting us together tonight. Pray for safety. Praying for our nation. Give our leaders wisdom. We're praying for a cure for COVID-19. Lord, we're just praying it just to be over. Uh, Lord, praying for people's jobs and financial situations and health. Those that are sick, Lord. Uh, uh, we know some people that are sick. Lord, would you just bring about healing in their life, Father, so we could get back to serving you with all that we've got. We're just praying for revival in our nation. Bring us close to you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, church, listen. It's been good to be together tonight. I hope you enjoyed our Bible study. Uh, I think we're gonna close with a song because I think that would be good to do on Good Friday. Take some gospel tracks, and tomorrow when you go shopping or you go to the store, or you go to Aldi or you go to pick and save, you go to Costco, whatever. Would you hand out some gospel tracts? Would you do that? All right, everybody. Have a great night. God bless. Amen. What a great message tonight. What a great uh, reminder of what Christ did for us on the cross, the, the, the sheer agony that he faced, the separation from the Father, all those things because he wanted us to be with him. Uh, and that's how we have salvation. It's in Christ alone. So today we're going to close with this song. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He's my light, he's my strength, and my song. Let's sing this out together.
then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt in life no fear in death this of Christ in me, from life's first cry to a final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand, till he returns, or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. great promise for all of us. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight.